May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. On this second Sunday of Advent, repentance seems to be the theme of the day. We hear from Peter and his assurance that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And then, as is always the case on the second Sunday of Advent, John the Baptist appears, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And repentance, indeed, has been a theme operating in the background of our readings, at least for the last three weeks. And as such, I think it's worth exploring just what that means. What is repentance? Now, I ask this only somewhat rhetorically because I want you to consider what it means to repent for you and how that word itself and all of its connotations of guilt and sin and fire and brimstone work on us? Does repent simply mean that we straighten up and fly right? That we adhere to some list of do's and don'ts that ensure that we're right with God? Or is it something more? Something deeper that's not so easily apprehended? Our gospel today from the opening verses of Mark give us some clue as to how Jesus' earlier followers may have understood repentance. Written around the year 70, some 40 years after Jesus' resurrection, the Gospel of Mark speaks to a people who are struggling. There's a war on. Some radical Jews have revolted against Rome, and Jerusalem is under siege at the point that this is this is being written the gospel of mark the people are divided some see god raising up leaders and warriors to push the romans out of jerusalem but then you have others on the other side who see submission to rome as the only path to peace and security people are caught between fear and resentment of the of the brutality of the roman military but then apprehension and mistrust of the extremist revolutionaries on the other side. And adding to the mix is the fact that Rome itself is in chaos. The emperor Nero has died, and in the year that follows his death, four men have been assassinated who were named emperor. And then finally... Vespasian, the general who who had seized Jerusalem, has been named emperor, and no one really knows what that means for the siege of Jerusalem. The world is in turmoil, and the future is uncertain. The city itself, Rome, the audience to whom Mark would have been writing, was a mix of Jews and Gentiles. And There was a lot of distrust between these two groups. And yet, and yet, in the midst of all this, there was one small group that refused to fight on either side. The followers of a Galilean rabbi named Jesus, who had been crucified about 40 years previous. Now, the Roman loyalist suspected this this small group of followers as secretly continuing this insurrection that had had begun in his name. On the other side, though, we have the rabbis who called this group heretics and the Jewish revolutionaries who dismissed them as being ineffective against the Roman occupation, that they couldn't do anything. This is the world to whom Mark was writing. This is the world to whom Mark our earliest gospel writer 
first proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Or as one translation puts it, the beginning of the good tidings of Jesus, the anointed. Which I like because not only do some people say it's a little closer to the original, but for me, it's unfamiliar. And I think about how those words must have been probably a little unfamiliar to other people who heard them for the first time. Now, the quote that follows from the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That would have been very familiar to Mark's Jewish readers, as would the situation to, to which Isaiah himself was responding, the occupation of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. They were struggling too. Even though it was centuries before, that feeling of struggle, the feeling of being occupied, the feeling of being controlled was very present to both of these these writers. Now, although John the Baptist was not the specific figure to whom Isaiah was referring, he was following a long line of prophets before him who also heralded the coming of something new, of God breaking into creation to set things right. The people have been waiting, and this is the world into which Jesus comes. John the Baptist is here to tell us to be ready. And so I return to a variation of my original question. What does it mean to be ready? Is readiness and repentance the same thing? Now, as I said earlier, the word repent is full of connotations. Guilt, shame, sorrow sometimes, just to name a few. And what often happens when we attach such feelings to that word is that we end up looking back rather than forward. But Advent is a time to look forward, to turn to face a new future. One way to translate that that Greek word that we have is repent here, the word is metanoia. One way to translate it is simply to turn. In Advent, that turning, that can be understood as a turning to the coming light reorienting ourselves to a new point of reference. To repent is to turn away from that which has bound us in the past and open ourselves to God's coming future, to unbind us from that which has bound us to something that has happened before so that we are open to something happening anew. It's to live in a present that opens to God's promised future, a present that is always open to receive. This is the reorientation to which John is calling us. It is a transformation of the heart, a new way of being in a world that sometimes seems out of control, a world that sometimes often seems out of control. It is a way of recognizing that we live not in chaos, but that we are journeying together toward the end that is Christ. In our epistle today, Peter writes that to the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. His readers have been waiting a long time. We have been waiting a long time. The four weeks of Advent that we we use just to mark this time is just a blip in the great scheme of things, but they invite us to a new orientation. We are invited into God's time, kairos, eternal time, to repent to live with a transformed heart, to reorient toward the coming Christ 
is to recognize the peace of Christ that is already with us. The peace of Christ that is already in us. Emmanuel, God with us. John the Baptist says, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. It's not about John. It's not about us. In Advent, we are called to awaken, to rouse from our lingering in the dark, and to look at what is being made new in Christ. Like Mark's first readers, we live in difficult times, and things do not always make sense. We struggle, we doubt, we fear, and yet we're called to something new. May we all have eyes to see and ears to hear. May we all turn to that which beckons to us from just beyond what the world says is possible. Amen. Amen.